well? How do they make some of these reports um, of incidents that happen in campus? Um, so, and then the second part is the reporting part. So what reportings are in place, whether they're online, whether they're in person, whether they're anonymous. Um, and this just kind of depends and varies on institution by institution and state by state. Um, then you have the crisis support programs that compose um, of campus safety. So whether this is victim assistance, counseling and psychological services, um, suicide prevention and all these different kind of programs that come as prevention as well as after um, something has happened in order to help a student or an employee on campus. And then comes emergency preparedness, which is emergency management. So the planning, the coordination, preparedness, and the recovery of a natural or man-made disaster. So this applies to shootings, floods, earthquakes, and in this case, a 2020 pandemic that has happened, which I, I think in a lot of, um, in our minds, that was not present, um, thinking about when looking into this emer emergency management. Um, and then goes into the prevention. So. Um, issues that are in place or guidelines that are in place uh, for the prevention of such things. So night rides, emergency uh, lighting, hotlines, crisis support programs, all these different things that form part of the prevention. And again, all these varies from institution to institution um, and from state to state, whatever policies they have in place. Um, in terms of currently the current situation of state campuses, um, of COVID-19, the CDC has provided guidance for higher education institutions. Um, and actually today they released, just this morning, they released their uh, provisions for reopening campuses or their guidelines for reopening campuses in the fall, depending on the level of risk. So they have it in three different, uh, they have three different levels of um, guidelines that they provided for campuses. Uh, low risk, medium risk, and high risk. Whether that is turning everything virtual, um, hybrid models or going all in person. Um, so they really encourage institutions of higher education working together with local health departments to have an important role um, in the spread of diseases and protecting vulnerable populations and students and staff. Um, there's also guidance uh, for institutions of higher education uh, organized in three categories. When there's no community transmission, uh, when there's a minimal to moderate community transmission, and when there's a substantial community transmission. Um, and then all decisions about implementing um, institutions higher base strategies should be made in collaboration with their local health officials, according to the CDC. In terms of the legislative action for emergency preparedness and management, there has been two bills that have been introduced in Louisiana and Maryland. Um, the Louisiana bill is currently pending, and it's Senate Bill 489, which requires post-secondary education management boards to adopt policies to address the negative impacts on post-secondary students, faculty, and other employees by the public health emergency declared by the governor in response to the novel coronavirus. Um, and then Mar Maryland House Bill 187, which requires public institutions uh, of higher education to submit an outbreak response plan to the Maryland Department of Health or on before August 1st on each year, beginning in 2021. So this also requires a public institution of higher education to implement the outbreak response plan under certain circumstances and requiring the outbreak response plan to include certain processes and the provision of certain staff. So I believe we're going to start seeing a lot of these bills come into place as long, and also a lot of the revisions um, in the campus guidelines and safety procedures um, that universities have in place. Um, as we're all aware, on March 6th, uh, the University of Washington became the first major university to cancel in-person class and exams. By the middle of March, colleges across the country had followed um, their students and more than 1,000 colleges and universities in all the 50 states have canceled in-person classes um, or shifted to um, online-only instructions. So as colleges maintain bans on large gatherings and many spring graduation, if not most of them, have been canceled or postponed. Um, currently, universities and colleges are trying to figure out how they're going to come back um, in the fall whether that is online instruction, whether that is um, a hybrid model. Um, and just, it's, it's, it's kind of up in the air. Just because um, institutions of higher education 
need to figure out how to introduce social distancing into spaces that are designed to bring people together. So when you're looking at classrooms, dining facilities, study lounges, campus housing, so how all this is going to work out. Um, and obviously that brings up into the budget cuts during COVID-19. So states that are required to balance their budget, um, so often that goes into the cutting of public higher education. So then that goes into how the schools are going to manage bringing back together. How does that affect their enrollment? So this is kind of something that it's up in the air. Um, so we will see what what happens in that sense of the current situation of college campuses. Assemblywoman, your your mic is muted, I think. Oh, I, I can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you so much for that presentation. We're going to ask you to stay with us for a little longer, so in case there's any questions at the end. And we will move right to uh, Chief Garcia, please. Thank you, Chairwoman Miller. Uh, for the record, my name is Adam Garcia. I'm the uh, Associate Vice President and Director of Police Services for the Southern Command. Uh, and uh, that includes uh, UNLV, CSN, Nevada State College, and the Desert Research Institute uh, in, in Las Vegas. And uh, the spelling of my name is Adam, A-D-A-M, Garcia, G-A-R-C-I-A. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to, uh, first of all, I appreciate the Maryland's presentation there. I um, wanted to, to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the crime stats on our campus in the Southern Command. On page eight and nine of the um, PowerPoint that was sent to you, you will see that the vast majority of the crimes, uh, UNLV, CSN, Nevada State, DRI, and Las Vegas, are larceny complaints. Uh, so we are a, a victim rich environment. Um, and so when we talk about uh, comparing us to, to our partners in here in Vegas, North Las Vegas, uh, Metro, uh, in Henderson, you see that, that because of the victim-rich environment in which we operate, our, our, our larcenies are pretty high, um, but in other categories, uh, we're pretty low. Um, uh, Marilyn had talked about the uh, Cleary. Uh, we are a Cleary-compliant institution, or all four institutions. Um, I've been in my position for uh, about 15 months now. Uh, we have appointed a Clery Compliance Coordinator whose full-time job is to ensure that uh, the three institutions uh, that have to comply with Clery are compliant. That's all she does is, is ensures uh, that we're compliant, issues an annual uh, security report to the Department of Education and to the public, and that is available, by the way, on our website for the last uh, three years. And uh, another thing that Marilyn had talked about was emergency management. Emergency management in Southern uh, Nevada falls for the NSHE falls within police services. Uh, we have a fully functioning EOC uh, on the main campus of UNLV, and we're in the process of building uh, a, uh, a backup dispatch as well as a um, emergency management center um, at the North Las Vegas uh, campus of CSN. Before I turn it over to my counterpart, uh, Chief Frederick, I wanted to just give a little uh, insight into where we are today. Um, I was the chief at UNR for 18 years. Um, and since day one, when I walked in the door in Reno, um, there was always talk of a consolidation of police services. It come and go with the ebb and flow of whatever was going on. In 2016, the Board of Regents directed uh, UNR and TMCC to consolidate police services. Uh, we ultimately did that. Um, in uh, 2016, we were consolidated. During that period of time, uh, there was a considerable amount of, of um, issues that were taking place. And we were able to uh, do a number of things as it related to um, consolidation in, in northern Nevada. So once we combined under one uh, police service uh, in, in northern Nevada, um, the, 
the we realize the savings of about four hundred and thirty two thousand dollars each year of the consolidation so if you think in long terms you know, we're talking 10-year period we're talking almost five million dollars of funding that could be reinvested back into the colleges back to into our students um, <clears throat> in 20 uh, 19, um, I was fortunate enough to be offered a position to come to Southern Nevada. Um, and one of the first things that, that I was tasked with was to consolidate police services in, in Southern Nevada. So that the, the process that took place in Reno was repeated in Las Vegas. Um, I came here in January of uh, 2019. Uh, the past uh, 15 months, uh, have been very eventful. Uh, we've had two pedestrian traffic deaths immediately adjacent to our campus at UNLV. Uh, one of them was within the jurisdiction of University Police Services. And uh, in order to address this issue, the department utilized grant funding from the Office of Traffic Safety, a little bit more on grants here in a minute, to take part in a traffic education enforcement campaign targeting pedestrian and crosswalk safety at both UNLV and the CSN Charleston campus. Um, in, in one month, we issued 51 warnings or citations, uh, and uh, we have greatly increased uh, the, the number of uh, public contacts that we have with our students. Uh, police services operates under the assumption that we're stewards, good stewards of student and taxpayer funds, and that those funds, funds should be spent wisely. To that end, um, so far in my 15 uh, months here, uh, we have had a cost savings of $1.7 million because of the consolidation. And so I think the question is, how do you, how do you achieve, uh, achieve that? So we did a couple of things. One, we leveraged technology to our advantage by implementing uh, hall, uh, security cameras in residential halls, established access controls, enhanced lighting, employment of crime prevention, uh, through environmental design, also known as the CPED approach. Uh, assignment of dedicated officers who lay uh, liaison with students and staff uh, in order to pro provide appropriate safety training, visibility, and establish those partnerships. At CSN, we eliminated the police dispatch contract with the Clark County St School District and bought, brought all dispatch, including security monitoring stations that were located at each one of the campuses, folded them all into one central dispatch. So now the four institutions in Southern Nevada receive uh, police response from one department, one dispatch, one number will get you a police response. In the past, everything was duplicated. You had a, two chiefs, you had two dispatch centers, actually it was more than that. And so it's all been combined under one. In Nevada State College, we eliminated after hour security patrols and began providing 24-hour, uh, uh, seven-day-a-week uh, uh, response and patrols across the board to all of our institutions. So we think that we have um, not only saved our students and taxpayers a great deal of funding, again, $1.7 million, and that is forever. So every year of the consolidation, that is what we're looking at is the cost savings. But we've also, um, I think enhanced safety. Uh, we've moved to more of a law enforcement approach. We've uh, created additional positions. Um, and so we've enhanced safety, we've eliminated duplicated um, positions and, and efforts in the, in the one umbrella. In addition to the cost savings, the department has aggressively pursued grant funding in the amount of uh, $2 million since February, 2019. So far, we have been awarded about half a million dollars just in that 15 month period in awards from a variety of different uh, uh, sources. Um, <clears throat> we obviously employ community oriented policing philosophy. We've conducted hundreds of outreach events in those 15 months, including self defense classes, uh, active shooter presentations, safety trainings, and other community uh, events like coffee with a cop, donuts with a director, and pizza. Uh, with the police. We've consolidated all emergency notification systems as something that Mary, Mary Lynn was talking about. Um, we have one emergency notification system now system-wide in Southern Nevada. All four institutions 
can receive in the event of a critical event, uh, an emergency notification uh, through text or, or other means. Um, on the downside, um, the department continues to struggle with attracting and retaining qualified candidates. Uh, we currently have two officers completing field training. We have six in the academy who will graduate uh, in about 30 days. And uh, we have another six who uh, we intend on sending to the academy in, uh, in July. Um, we still have uh, about uh, 20 vacancies. Uh, we're a department of about 80 sworn positions with about 160 total employees um, in two separate divisions. So uh, I tell you that, that we have these vacancies. Uh, if you're interested in law enforcement, I'll hire you. Um, if you know anybody who's interested, have them see me and uh, we'll get the ball rolling. So with that, that concludes uh, my report. Thank you so much, Chief. Uh, we will now, it sounds like me when, I, when I'm when i saying the same about education, like we have plenty of plenty of openings, please join us. Um, next, we have Chief Renwick from um, Northern Command. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Todd, Ren, Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity uh, and the rest of the committee. Uh, Todd Renwick, Assistant Vice President, Chief of Police for Northern Command. That's T-O-D-D. R-E-N-W-I-C-K. Um, I think what you're going to hear uh, is a kind of a standard theme here between the North and the South. And I think one of the things that consolidation has brought the Nevada system of higher education is uh, a standardization of how uh, police services will be delivered uh, in the North and the South. Um, myself and my colleague, um, Director Garcia, uh, we, we operate very similar. Uh, we communicate uh, and we work together at making sure that the institutions we both serve uh, receive uh, the same type of services uh, across the board. Um, <clears throat> some, so for my institutions in the north, uh, I have uh, the University of Nevada, Reno, Truckee Meadows Community College, the Desert Research Institute North, uh, as well as Western Nevada College. And uh, we have a unique hybrid kind of uh, shared services agreement with Great Basin College to help them with uh, police matters. In the last 15 months since I took over here at the university, uh, some of the things that I have been uh, working on are our MOUs with all the counties uh, and cities that we operate in as a, a system. Uh, that's getting uh, agreements established on uh, re crime reporting, uh, sharing services, as well as um, working together if they're uh, handling cases related to uh, the Nevada system of higher education. And I think we're, we're seeing some success in that with those relationships. Um, uh, interesting enough, when you look at our crime stats too, you see uh, where we have property crime high, violent crime low, uh, uh, and we often uh, tell our uh, faculty, staff, and students that um, of course, never let your guard down, don't get complacent, but uh, you are very safe here on our campuses when you look at our crime stats. Uh, the only thing we really have to continue to preach are uh, our communities to safeguard their belongings uh, because that's where we see uh, the problems happen. Um, we have been very focused on um, dealing with um, crimes against our community. One of the things that we did a while back is uh, we uh, along with the university entered into a, well, we didn't enter into, we received a grant from uh, the Violence Against Women, VAWA, where we got about $300,000 to begin um, in-depth training, not only with police officers, but with our um, campus community and local law enforcement. We created a, what's called a, community, a coordinated community response team to deal with violence against women, uh, in particular in, in sexual assault victims and interviewing uh, techniques, um, getting more uh, reporting, uh, trust amongst law enforcement. Uh, that led into uh, receiving a $240,000 grant to hire our own victim services coordinator. And basically it's an advocate. Uh, we have a campus advocate who can uh, not only work with uh, the university, uh, but all of our campuses in making sure that students, faculty, or staff who are experiencing interpersonal violence have 
uh, the resources available to them here uh, with with folks they trust. So <clears throat> we we've, we've been working on um, a lot of that bridging uh, those gaps with our um, victims, especially as it relates to the interpersonal violence, crime, sexual assault. Um, I, I uh, appreciated that presentation at the beginning, Marilyn. Thank you for that. Um, we we do uh, work a lot at emergency preparedness, uh, much like you see in the South. We we have uh, similar uh, processes and um, action up here. Um, Unfortunately, we've had some practice at it. In the last year, we had a, a fairly significant explosion in one of our res halls. Uh, and then um, tailing that is our pandemic that we're in. Um, we have been doing a lot of training. So as a, as a university, we were able to seamlessly uh, assemble and work through these, uh, I think, very successfully. And we've continued those trainings. Uh, the, the theme that, that you see here is, and I think both with the North and the South, is we are very community service um, proactive. We uh, embed ourselves into our communities. We embed ourselves into the students. Uh, I do um, bi-weekly brown bag lunch with uh, student groups, uh, student groups, whether it's ASUN senators uh, or members of um, our QSU Queer Student Union. Um, to all of the groups. Uh, I have round bag lunch every two weeks in my office with different groups where we sit down and we, we talk about issues and, and ways that we can resolve them. Uh, we do a lot of tabletop training amongst our institutions in the north uh, to plan for these types of uh, unexpected emergencies, whether it's a pandemic, explosion, uh, natural disaster, uh, active shooter. Uh, we do a lot of uh, officer training. Um, where we put our officers into these realistic trainings. We invite the community. We have our students involved in it, uh, as well as all of our other uh, public safety agencies that, that come and partake in these. And, and much like you see um, uh, down in the South, we do a lot of um, self-defense classes. We teach CrossFit uh, at our uh, fitness center. Uh, and it's a great way to, to, to bridge those gaps between students uh, staff when they see officers in a different perspective than the gym clothes uh, teaching those classes. Um, I don't want to take too much more time because I, I, I know a lot of this is repetitive that you hear uh, or have heard from, from Director Garcia. Uh, so I'll uh, end it at that. Thank you, Chief. Are there any questions from any committee members? I just, I just have one question. I um, am so through the presentation, it seems like the, the, the crimes and the incidences that we're referring to are things that normally and naturally happen in a college setting in uh, the dorms and the parking lots in, in those types of areas. But I'm just out of curiosity because I know in K through 12, there's been an increase of violent acts in the classroom. And so I'm just wondering if in our college settings, do we have any instances that are occurring in the classrooms, whether it's the um, student to student or student to instructor professor? Or, you know, God forbid, professor to a uh, student. I think those kinds of interactions, at least in Southern Nevada, in my, my 18 year time in, in Northern Nevada are, uh, there are few uh, and far between. Um, they would be reported if, if they did happen, so uh, they would be recorded, recorded in our statistical information. But I would say that it, it's very rare to see that kind of uh, interaction. Um, you know, when, when we look at it, it uh, assaults um, either way with between students or between uh, faculty members and students or vice versa, just doesn't occur. Um, I think that when you have a closed, confined area like the dorms, um, the residential housing, I think you're talking about a, a little different story. And, and so when you look at, uh, for instance, the sexual assaults that are reported at UNR, they're higher than they are at uh, UNLV. And that's only because uh, their uh, on-campus housing uh, population is about twice the number of what we have here. So you see these variances when you've got these folks living in very close proximity to each other. 
Um, Todd Bremick for the record, and I, I do agree we, we see um, low occurrences of what you described, uh, but we do uh, do a lot of interacting uh, with students who are in distress, who are distraught, who are experiencing outside influences that are affecting their academics and, and uh, you know, quite honestly, they're, they're just at that point where they're really stressed and they might be displaying some sort of uh, mannerisms that um, make people concerned. Uh, we do have a threat assessment manager here uh, on staff that, that manages cases and works with other faculty. Uh, we have a, uh, what we call a student intervention team that assembles once a week and they, they address these issues and talk about um, students uh, that are in need of resources. They work with uh, different members of our campus community to triage those so they can get those students the resources they need to be successful. Um, thank you for that. And, and just a quick follow up, if you could either one of you give a brief response. I always like to make sure that we know where we as um, Nevada stand when it comes to certain issues, especially in education. So I know we have much fewer uh, colleges and universities than many states, but on a whole, especially UNR and UNLV, which does have dormitories, where would you say that we fall in terms of um, safety for our universities, meaning a, a safe environment compared to other universities throughout the country? Wh wh where does Nevada fall? Well, if I can answer that, uh, and, and I think that uh, Chief Reynolds may want to for, for the North, but in the South, obviously, uh, you know, when you, when you are in this area, uh, this is, this is a pretty tough, tough neighborhood, but the campus itself and the statistics will bear this out. Um, is a, a very safe campus. Uh, this year, uh, uh, Campus Safety Magazine rated um, UNLV in, in the police department is one of the top 10 safest uh, campuses in the country. So I think that, that we're, you know, when you compare us to um, the institutions of higher education that are in this environment, I think that we do very, very well uh, nationally. Todd Renwick for the record. Um, I'll agree with that. Um, I'm a father who has a daughter here currently and lived in the res halls and I have one coming in the fall and I'm very comfortable with them uh, in our res halls. Excellent. We're always happy to hear that. And I just wanted to, um, Ms. Villalobos, would you have any follow-up or additional information on that? I would just, uh, Marilyn Villalobos for the record, um, I would just second that, um, just even on the mention part two, that nationally too, the trends tend to be very low in those crimes that you mentioned before. Um, usually the top one, it's like burglary, which goes more for like students keeping their belongings and all that sense. Um, and in terms of the second one, um, I just second what the officers have said. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we just have one more question from Assemblywoman Tolls. Thank you so much and good to see you both, Chiefs Garcia and Renwick. Um, in regards to the VAWA funding, is that also available to be used for um, sex trafficking and um, more particularly been concerned about the increased rise of solicitation um, through, you know, sugar daddy towards um, college students and, and K through 12 students as well? Um, seeing a, definitely seeing a rise in that um, particularly while we've been in lockdown um, due to COVID. Uh, there's been just an increased solicitation um, through cyber means. Just wondering if that was included in um, the resources available and how that might be used. Thanks Assemblywoman Tolls. Uh, Todd Renwick for the record. Uh, to answer your question, no, not it wasn't written that way in the VAWA grant. That's why I, I joined your Northern Nevada Sex Trafficking uh, Committee because I, I need to learn more about this. I want to learn more about this. Uh, we do have a uh, detective who, uh, from our agency who's assigned to our regional street enforcement team. Part of that is they do work uh, sex trafficking uh, related crime. So we're, we're trying to see how it's affecting us um, and how, how deep it really goes so we can look at pursuing uh, funds to, to combat that as well. And uh, we are in Southern Nevada, we're working closely with our law enforcement partners um, on, on this issue. Of course, as you and I have talked, um, th this is one of those issues that 
that it's, it's so underwater that most folks don't see it, nor do they recognize it. And I think that uh, the educational components as it relates to how we, uh, the, the presentations that we conduct, we do talk about this. We want to ensure that uh, these issues are well known, but it's a that's a very tough nut to crack just because it, it's one of those things that is not seen. You can see a robbery, you can see a car accident, but you can't see this. And so uh, working on the educational component with us is very important. I appreciate that. Um, consider it a public service announcement as a mother of two teenage daughters who has um, had that solicitation on a regular basis and they have a mom who's um, taught them to look for it and know exactly what it is, but that is um, increasing in unbelievable measures. So I appreciate you all being a part of that education and enforcement process. Thank you as well. Any further questions from committee members? Okay, with that, we will wrap up this agenda item and we will move to, uh, thank you for your presentations. We will move to agenda item seven, which is a pre presentation on Nevada's early learning programs, including updates on two previous bills that were passed last session, Senate Bill 84 and Assembly Bill 194. So we will have presentations from Marty Elquist, the chair of the Nevada Early Childhood Advisory Council, Patty Oya from Department of Education, and Jared Busker and Kate McNabney from the Children's Advocacy Alliance. We'll go through the same process. Please present in order, and then we will hold our questions for the end. So um, Ms. Elquist, when you are ready, please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and distinguished members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity uh, for me to present on behalf of Nevada's Early Childhood Advisory Council. Um, my name is Marty Elquist and I currently serve as the ECAC Chair. I am also the Director of the Supporting Early Education and Development Department of the Children's Cabinet. AB 194 modified the membership of the Council to include a member who is a representative of the pediatric, mental, physical, or behavioral health care industry. Um, as you know, the entire ECAC had to resubmit for reappointment um, in July of 2019, and we are still awaiting the appointment of six ECAC members, and one of which is the new health care member. Uh, after those six members are appointed, the ECAC will have a total of 17 members. In addition, AB 194 required an annual summary of the council's activities. Uh, the council has been really uh, focused for the last three years on our strategic planning process and now the implementation and monitoring of our strategic plan. The first version of the 2018 to 2021 plan was approved by the council and submitted to Governor Brian Sandoval uh, May of 2018. The plan was updated June of 2019 and then again in December of 2019 to ensure uh, the plan was aligned with the birth through third grade steering committee's recommendations and then the Nevada Preschool Development B5 Planning Grant uh, Parent Needs Assessment and then the Pritzker Children's Initiative Prenatal to Age 3 Grant. Um, the first ECAT progress report was submitted to Governor Sisolak's office and LCB on December 2nd of 2019. I have also been asked to specifically address the early learning components of the ECAC strategic plan. Um, before I do, I'd like to acknowledge the two early learning committee chairs, Anna Severins from the Nevada Department of Education and Ms. Tina Springmeyer from the Washoe County School District Ms. Severins and Ms. Springmeyer, along with members of their committee, uh, have spent countless hours creating and monitoring progress on 80 action steps to achieve the six objectives that I'm going to re review with you today. Um, I did not submit a PowerPoint. However, the strategic plan can be found on the ECAC website. That is nvecac.com. The strategic plan is listed on our reports and documents page. Um, under the document subheading, which is about halfway down that page, uh, you'll find a link to the strategic plan there, 
as well as a one-page infographic on the entire strategic plan. Before I focus on the early learning section of the strategic plan, I think it's extremely important to note that all areas of children's development must be supported in order for children to reach their full potential. In addition to providing excellent early learning systems, the ECAC strategic plan has two additional goal areas. The second, which I will not review today, is to ensure families have the support they want and need to nurture their children's early learning and development through strong community engagement. And third, to support increased access to and to the delivery of high quality evidence-based health services for families with young children, including dental, physical, and be mental and behavioral health. Um, it's extremely difficult to meet children's learning needs if their physical, emotional health needs are not addressed and their families are not supported in meeting these needs and engaged in their child's learning and development. This certitude is foundational to the ECAC's work and to the strategic plan, which is focused on the coordination and alignment of services and sectors with intentional strategies devoted to the developmental continuum of children birth through third grade. Mm. All sectors serving our young children must work together to support children's progression through er through the early learning system. In order to change child outcomes by third grade, we must change adult and organizational behaviors and the way we fund and implement early childhood services, recognizing that funding often dictates how services are and can be implemented. So the overall goal of the early learning section of the ECAT strategic plan is to strengthen the complex system of early learning to provide every child and family with high quality early childhood education and development. This section starts on page nine, if you're following along um, on our website in our strategic planning document. And in this section, there are four guiding principles that shape the objectives and strategies and action steps of this, the strategic plan. And the first guiding principle is that we must create alignment to support the full developmental curriculum, uh, excuse me, full developmental continuum of children birth through third grade. Uh, second, we must address the fragmentation that interferes with the quality of services being delivered across different settings and different geographical areas. We must unify and build a high quality early childhood workforce. And we have to expand our investment in early childhood education. But first, we must build upon the work conducted by Metrics IQ under the PDGB5 planning grant to understand what it will cost to provide high quality early learning programs to Nevada's children across all settings and geographical areas. So the first objective underneath the early learning section of the strategic plan is to address early childhood education in terms of workforce and economic development. Early childhood is central to economic and workforce development strategy to recruit and retain a qualified workforce that includes young parents. Mm -hmm. And the research is clear on the importance of high quality early childhood experiences of children's, for, excuse me, for children's academic and lifelong success. Early childhood is a two generational approach to improving the lives of all Nevadans. The Children's Cabinet's 2018 demographics report revealed that Nevada's licensed child care capacity meets 35% of the need for children ages zero through five, living in households where all parents are in the workforce. There is additional capacity in school district pre-K programs that will be discussed by Ms. Oya's presentation, but it's important to remember that at best, district pre-K programs are six hours a day and additional care supports are needed for working parents who have young children in these programs. My colleagues, Ms. McNabney and Mr. Busker will also be discussing the impact of COVID on our current childcare capacity and the essential role childcare plays in our response and recovery efforts. The second objective is to revise and align child program and workforce standards for all programs and personnel in the birth through third grade early childhood field. Progress to achieve this objective was made underneath the PDG B5 planning grant. However, because Nevada was not funded to continue with an implementation grant, 
there is still much work to do. A final report on the standards progress and next steps is due to NDE from the contractor SRI by the end of the month. And we're looking forward to that report. The third objective is to unify early childhood and early elementary workforce from birth through third grade. It is estimated that there are 15,000 professionals in Nevada who work with children birth through third grade. However, the training and professional development looks very different for a professional working in a first uh, grade classroom or even a district pre-K classroom versus a professional working in a licensed childcare setting. Both have the same job to educate and care for Nevada's youngest citizens. The fourth objective is to review the placement and alignment of state offices, including child care licensure and Part C IDEA with other B3 entities. The first strategy underneath this objective was to explore the pros and the cons and the steps needed to move state offices. And it was determined that better coordination across agencies would likely yield the same goal. This resulted in a policy recommendation that is included in the Pritzker Prenatal to Age 3 grant calling for the establishment of a Children's Commission or similar office position within the governor's office. Mm. The fifth objective calls for greater workforce investment through wage and incentive programs that reward increased education levels. Demands on early childhood professionals are only increasing and we have learned more about early learning brain science and the critical role through third grade developmental period. Mm -hmm. However, the average entry wage for licensed child care teachers remains about $11 an hour. And the median is $11.50 or $23,920 a year. This is $11,000 less than the median income for Nevada workers. Therefore, it is no surprise that one out of four early childhood teachers leave their center-based job every year, which is traumatic given the incredible importance of bonding and attachment for optimal child development. This objective calls for mapping all B3 financing and identifying opportunities. You see, that just doesn't bring any accountability. They get the training and then they just go away. And longevity incentives of birth to age five early childhood teachers in all settings. The objective also calls for mobilizing a task force to seek county, municipal, and private investments in wage and incentive programs. The sixth and final objective calls to allocate personal, excuse me, personnel, and not my personal, personnel and financial resources to integrate early childhood data. An extraordinary amount of early childhood research and data is collected across programs such as the Nevada Registry, the Office of Early Learning and Development, the Department of Welfare and Supportive Services Child Care Program, Child Care Licensing, Teach Early Childhood, the Quality Rating and Improvement System, Nevada Early Intervention, Resource and Referral. However, these data are not integrated into a comprehensive early childhood data system nor are they linked to the state's longitudinal data system. Additionally, depending on the data system, many, many of these data are not readily available. Progress is being made on improvements to the state's child care subsidy data system, which is aiming to integrate other data stores, for example, licensing, quality rating and improvement system, or QIS, resource and referral. However, we must also invest in designated personnel to manage early childhood data across these and other systems, for example, pre-K, Nevada Early Intervention, home visiting, and build upon positions such as NDE's Office of Early Learning and Development Data Manager, who assist in the collection and evaluation of organic screening data. Given the importance of early childhood and the call to increase both public and private dollars, we must be able to evaluate the success of our efforts and the return on our investments. Thank you again for the opportunity to present the early learning portion of the ECAC strategic plan. Uh, these objectives are pivotal to ensure that all Nevada's children will be safe, healthy, and thriving during the first eight years of life, and the system will support children and families in achieving their full potential.
Thank you, and I'll take any questions when the time is appropriate. Thank you so much. Next, we have Ms. Oya from the Department of Education. Good afternoon. Uh, for the record, my name is Patty Oya, P-A-T-T-I-O-Y-A, with the Nevada Department of Ed for the Office of Early Learning and Development. Um, from what I understand, you have my PowerPoint in front of you, and I will just go through the slides. Uh, slide number two is showing our current pre-K allocations and uh, for the 1920 school year and the total seed count from December 1. So serving 3,099 children uh, from age four under families from under 200% federal poverty limit. The braided funding column shows uh, an additional funding that is needed. This was reported by our grantees to support uh, the quality program that is needed. So I um, wanted to show the kind of the full budget pieces needed for the high quality program. On slide three, it shows the history of Nevada pre-K funding, uh, the orange being state funding, and then the four years that we received the original preschool development grant. The federal grant is in, uh, is in yellow, and then the state match is in green, and then again this year and next year is, is again state pre-K funding only. So you have the history there of that funding. On the next slide, slide four, we do require uh, children in our state pre-K program to be screened when they enter and when they exit the program. And this shows the with the Brigand screen three, and this shows the results in just big buckets, what we call big buckets of um, cutoffs within normal limits below and beyond, and beyond. You can see from pre to post in 1718, the blue or even the pink, uh, in 1819, where children are really coming in almost 50% below normal limits and then and leaving 50% uh, are leaving at, at within normal or higher. So really uh, shows the impact of pre-K. I know I've presented this information before and kind of we're still trying to collect data on other programs, not just our state pre-K program. Um, of course, we won't have unfortunately have posts for this year but um, we will continue with these with this screening and adding the screening to child care programs as well. On slide five, you have the Brigant screen results again for 1819, but in age equivalency. So it really shows that under, under their age equivalent uh, chronological age and then above coming in at, and on average a negative 10 months and then leaving at, at an average of plus six months. And so um, that's that's an average of 16 months of growth in within the nine month school year. So showing again, showing the program works. On slide six, I did wanna include our preschool development grant update slide. It was, a, as uh, Ms. Elquist mentioned in the advisory update, we did receive the one year planning grant. We were able to accomplish those four uh, items, the comprehensive needs assessment, the alignment with our early childhood advisory strategic plan, the standards alignment, and then the most importantly, the fiscal feasibility study as well. I think that that's very telling. And then while we did not get the implementation grant, we were, we were very disappointed. We scored well, we scored 92 out of 109 points. It was disappointing, but we were told it was highly competitive. But on the positive, we have we have plans in place, and so if we can, you know, continue to search for outside funding, we will do so. Um, we were in our plan in our implementation grant things like expand our state pre-K to include some of the tribal communities that we're not including right now. We had started to kind of work with them and partner, and that the data integration and management system that um, Ms. Elquist talked about is you know we are ready to go with an RFP process and a, and a plan and an outline on how that would work a comprehensive consumer ed website so families can go to one place and really look for early childhood programs, what's available, and application process. So they don't have to go to program to program to fill out an application and get out the same questions and the same paperwork and those kind of things. We wanted to start a wages pilot, which is something that we've talked about for a long time in terms of child care providers, are recognized the same way district teachers are, are recognized in pay and the 
pay equivalent is not equivalent. And so a wages program it works to answer those questions. And then we were looking at staff childcare networks for our family childcare providers. And so we know that for, especially for infants and toddlers, family childcare is so important. And they don't always have the business support and the support of, of trying to market and bill and, and do all the business pieces. And so these staff networks was, was something that was written into our plan. And then two other things we wrote into our plan was intensive technical assistance project. So right now we've had our quality rating improvement system for quite a while and we still have some centers that are kind of staying at star level one and two. So we're doing some research this year right now to figure out what is the best support that they need to move up the quality and, and increase from a star level one or two to, to higher star levels. So we're doing the research because we didn't want to plan a, a pilot program or a technical assistance program without getting their input. Um, and then that was the plan was to use the implementation grant to uh, try to assist those centers. And then the last thing was we had a community innovations project in our grant. It was really up to the com each individual community to apply to work with their local early childhood advisory council. And then they could come up with a, an early childhood project that really would meet and be uh, helpful and useful to their own community. So we had, like I said, we have those plans in place. And it, at some point, if there's additional federal grants or other grant sources, then you know, certainly we're ready to go. On slide seven, I'll, I'll talk, speak just a little bit about Senate Bill 84. Uh, as you remember, it was passed during the 2019 session. It, it establishes the required components of state funded pre-K. Some of the ones are highlighted in green on your slide. Um, one in particular I'd like to point out is just the inclusion to serve pupils with disabilities. This is letter H. Um, at a rate that is not less than the percentage of pupils in the state or in the United States, whichever is greater. We really have uh, worked hard with our Office of Inclusive Education to make sure children with special needs are being included in their natural environments. They're not being separated out into classrooms. And so children with um, pre-K pre students, three to five, so this is beyond just our state pre-K program, our inclusion rate has increased from 2017 um, to 2019. It is now at 39%, which is really a, a number to celebrate. So we're really proud of that. But these, these uh, components of the state-funded pre-K were built off of the federal preschool development grant. We truly believe that all of them you kind of help build the quality of our state pre-K program. One piece of Senate Bill, eight, I'm on slide eight, Senate Bill 84 is the regulations that we need to draft with our sub grantees and our stakeholders. And so we're looking at when it when letter A talks about comprehensive services, we're looking at wraparound, what we call wraparound services. So if a family needs jobs, uh, job search help, um, housing, bills, those kind of things. Um, parenting, education, all of those wraparound services that are so important to uh, support a family that maybe that, that can't access those services in the K-12 system. Uh, we were providing those with the federal development grant. It was a sub award to the children's cabinet. They were providing those separately. You know, now and now more than ever, the families need those extra supports. We're looking to hopefully add those back in. Um, it will be a regulation, but um, you know, it'll be up to the districts to kind of provide those. Uh, letter B is talks about evaluation. And again, it's it's our right now, it's only a requirement to screen children uh, beginning and end. But then we also have a requirement that they complete a formal evaluation or assessment within the school year. We don't collect that information. We do um, just review and approve their assessment tool that they choose. Uh, Regulation C talks about family engagement, and so that we already do. Uh, we require all our programs in state pre-K to distribute an annual family survey and then come up with a family engagement plan. So we do that. And then D talks about program evaluation, and then again, that's our quality rating improvement system. When we have the federal preschool development grant, we were able to include our state pre-K programs into that program. and 
and it's it's nice because it's more than just a you know here's your star rating it's a system of support it's that eye for improvement that really makes the difference they get assigned a coach that works with the staff they they the programs assign an internal coach and that internal coach gets training and support so that the whole program can improve and really sustain those quality efforts uh, currently, we are, they are not, this year, they are not participating in the QIS. We, we did not have the funding. We're fortunate to add it to our child care and development funds for next school year, but considering, um, you know, what's, what we're going through, we may not be able to do that. So we're hoping that we can still have that as part of our state pre-K program as well. Slide nine goes into an annual report that's provided by the National Institute for Early Education Research, otherwise known as NEAR, and it, you see the benchmarks that they use to look at quality across programs. Uh, they track funding, access, and policies of state-funded preschool programs since 2001 and 2002 school year across the country. We don't meet, there's 10 benchmarks, we don't meet seven. We do address the, uh, the remaining three. We don't require a CDA for our teacher aides, but we do uh, provide the Teach Early Childhood Nevada Scholarship Program, which supports those aides and teachers in getting their degrees and staying in early childhood. Over the last three years, when we were able to include state pre-K into our TEACH program, uh, they awarded 61 scholarships to 38 teachers, 23 assistant teachers, the 37 are pursuing associate's degrees, 10 are um, pursuing bachelor's degrees, 14 are, are working on their birth to second grade licensure, so trying to really help those who in the field who needs the support and we want high quality teachers in those positions. And then the other benchmark is the vision, hearing, and dental screenings. Those will be addressed in SB 84 as part of that wraparound regulation. So we will make that a requirement. It, it's a difficult regulation for some of our districts because they, one, they don't have the funding to provide that if they can find a, a dentist or a vision uh, optometrist to screen. Um, but then in the rural areas, it might be very difficult to find any, whether you can afford to pay them or not. So we are writing those into the regulations, but we will continue to monitor the success. Slide 10, um, I just wanted to mention some national pre-K recommendations, but I know we're, we're long in the afternoon. So I'm gonna let the Children's Advocacy Alliance talk more about the big national picture and some of the issues that are coming up. But really, I think the one that's most important here is the greater coordination between the federal and state funded pre-K. Or, you know, so when, for Nevada, that would be like our Head Start programs and our pre-K programs, or the, the money we receive with the subsidy program. I'm really thinking about it in terms of a system and not just pots of money that go to support specific uh, children. And then my last slide, on uh, slide on number 11, Kind of looking at priorities or concerns that we're thinking about as, as the year goes on. Uh, on the left, it's very specific to pre-K and on the right, specific to childcare. But again, this is about an early, larger, you know, child, early childhood system and not just specific programs. But when we think about pre-K and we think about the low amount numbers of children we're really serving that who qualify for our pre-K programs, uh, right now, 8.2% of all four-year-olds in Nevada are being served, and 28.1% of all four-year-olds across all of our pre-K programs, including Head Start, are being served. So there's a lot of room there. But now with families being laid off, families not working, there are going to be more families that qualify for pre-K. And then the Zoom program uh, is an important piece in terms of pre-K as well for students who are English language learners. In this current year, when I talked about braided funding to support our state pre-K budget, there are five districts that use Zoom funding to support pre-K, and that's about $1.5 million. That's what they've reported. And then there are uh, an additional seven districts that provide Zoom pre-K specifically, and that's another $7 million. So when, we, when they're looking at the funding and Zoom funding for next year uh, not being categorical anymore. 
we really want to ensure that, that Zoom pre-K is represented and stays either and moves into state pre-K or somehow those children are not left out because pre-K for children who are English language learners would be even more important. And then the, the, obviously the child care concerns are huge. We do partner with the United Way of Southern Nevada and the community and community service agencies up north and thinking about our pre-K seats in child care is one issue, just space alone. Um, United Way, for example, partners with 13 child care facilities for 22 classrooms. Of those 13 facilities, nine have closed due to the COVID-19 situation. Overall, 290 state licensed facilities have closed since uh, that was the May 8th report. Um, 155 facilities remained open to serve children of essential workers, which is really important. I think, you know, we really need to remember how essential childcare is for the economy, for families to go back to work, for us, you know, all of us to go back to work. So um, we really think about, you know, childcare in terms of they've done some incredible things. The ones that have closed, our pre-K programs have done incredible work with the families. Uh, even with distance learning. And you can imagine if you have children, young children, or doing distance learning with a four-year-old looks very different than doing distance K-12. Um, they, they have to distribute a lot of materials, scissors, paper. So if they were trying to do activities, you know, through a Zoom meeting, they we didn't know if children had scissors. I mean, something that basic or crayons. And so sometimes that's that's just important. But for young children, and that brain development and the social emotional pieces of, of needing the interactions with teachers, needing the other interactions with other children on how that's when they learn. How do you get along with others? How do you how do you express your needs in appropriate ways is really an important time. So, it, you know, if we start to think about distance learning in the fall, children, you know, you to ask a family to to only come to childcare three days a week when they're trying to work full time or there are, you know, it, we're trying to distance in pre-K when the classrooms are so much smaller, but we're funding per child. I think there's a lot of issues here that affect pre-K differently than the K-12 system. So that is the end of my presentation and I'm happy to stay on at the end to, for questions, thanks. Thank you so much. We will now um, have Jared Busker and Kate McNabby um, McNabney from the Children's Advocacy Alliance. Please proceed when you're ready. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the Interim Committee on Education. For the record, my name is Jared Busker, J-A-R-E-D-B-U-S-K-E-R. I currently serve as Interim Executive Director at the Children's Advocacy Alliance. Kate McNabney, um, our school, policy readiness, or school readiness policy manager, is also on the phone to help answer any questions that may come up. The Children's Advocacy Alliance is a statewide nonprofit that serves as the independent voice for Nevada's children and families. We are dedicated to achieving public policy wins in the areas of children's safety, children's health, economic well-being, and school readiness. On March 20th, Governor Sisolak declared child care providers an essential service as workers across many sectors rely on these providers to care for their children while they work. It's worth mentioning that while providing care um, to children is a major component of child care, there are many other benefits that our children receive when attending high quality early learning programs, such as developing social and emotional and other skills needed um, for our children to enter school ready to learn, as Ms. Elquist and Ms. Oya mentioned earlier in their presentations. Since the governor's declaration, the Children's Advocacy Alliance has been in close contact with the early learning providers across the state. Um, we have also been hosting weekly early learning calls with our state and local administrators and have been in close conversations with other advocates across the nation. Today, I want to spend a little bit of time providing an update related to what we're hearing from providers, the initial steps the state has made to ensure the long-term stability of the childcare industry in Nevada and policy recommendations going forward. But to begin, 
Um, prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, Nevada's childcare industry was already on unsteady ground. Many of our providers were struggling to find a balance of how to, um, one, hire and pay their employees a competitive wage, while also ensuring that their slots remained affordable for parents. As Ms. Elquist mentioned earlier, the median wage of early childhood of an early childhood teacher working in a licensed center is just eleven dollars and eleven dollars and fifty cents an hour. Um, so we're competing those providers are competing with a host of other industries um, to get high quality teachers. Nevada also ranks as the least affordable in the nation for the cost of infant care in a licensed family child care um, system and then also the eighth least affordable for licensed centers. To put this into further context, a survey was conducted by the National Association for the Education of Young Children from March 12th through March 25th, asking providers in Nevada about the potential effects the pandemic um, would have on their businesses going forward. From that survey, and um, this was only Nevada-based responses, 20% of our providers said that they would not survive closing for more than two weeks without significant public investment and support that would allow them to compensate and retain staff, pay rent, and cover other fixed costs. 22% would not survive a closure of any length without, without these supports. 22% also said that they did not know how long they would be able to close their doors and be able to reopen without these supports. 29% have lost income because they are paid based on attendance rather than whole enrollment. And 45% have anticipated a lost income based on their family's inability to pay. Nevada's childcare industry has been significantly affected um, by the COVID-19 pandemic. As of May 15th, 68.9% um, of our providers in Clark, Clark County have closed. 37.7% of providers in Northern Nevada have closed. In total, across the entire state, over half of our providers have closed their doors. Um, based on provider type, we're seeing that more center-based providers are closing um, with 63.5% of our center-based providers closing their doors compared to 34.7% of our home-based providers closing. These closures are especially concerning as Nevada has still not returned to our pre-2008 capacity levels. And before the COVID-19 pandemic, Nevada's early, child, early childhood capacity only met 23% of the need for childcare for children ages zero to five. To help ensure the long-term stability of the childcare industry, the state has taken some much needed first steps. To date, um, providers have continued to receive subsidy payments based on their pre-COVID-19 enrollment numbers. Um, children participating in the subsidy program were not subject to termination based on the, their number of absent days. Um, we implemented, the state implemented 12 months redetermination for um, the, a child's redetermination um, was automatically renewed at this um, time. Um, so they can continue to receive care after um, the COVID pandemic and when, when they can return back to, um, to an enroll in child care slots. Um, on a case-by-case -case basis, co-pays in the wait list um, were waived for parents who have lost their jobs due to COVID-19. Um, licensed providers have been given flexibility in the ages of kids and hours that they can serve while they're open um, to be better responsive of the of the needs that we're seeing amongst our essential workers. The state has also implemented a registration process for emergency providers and helped match essential workers with slots. The state also started giving emergency supply stipends for providers. They've issued about 150 of those stipends so far, and that's to help address the increased needs providers have had due to the pandemic, such as um, buying sanitizing equipment or other PPE devices. And lastly, the state began implementing um, CARES Act grants. These grants cover up, up to three months of operating costs, regardless of whether or not they have received subsidy payments and or, the pay, or um, received the Paycheck Protection Program loans. Um, before I continue, we, want, we as an organization want to publicly thank our state administrators for their dedication to this work. They have been working tirelessly um, across the state to really ensure that our children are safe and well during this time and to ensure that we can, can 
continue to, to provide care um, so our essential workers can continue to work. Right now, it is important to provide as many supports to child care providers as possible. With such low enrollments and many closures, providers are not able to meet their basic monthly operating costs, um, including rent, utilities, insurance, and other associated costs that are critical to, to their long-term sustainability. While many providers are still receiving subsidy payments, this often does not even cover those basic operating costs. While federal programs such as the PPP loans I mentioned before can help in making up the shortfall that they're experiencing, we've heard from providers that they're having difficulty acquiring, acquiring such a loan for two reasons. The first is it's difficult for providers to get the loans because they operate on such small margins. And two, um, providers have expressed um, to the Children's Advocacy Alliance that they felt that they would have extreme difficulty meeting all of, the, all of the qualifications to convert the loans into grants and are reluctant, reluctant to apply because they feel like the, they would be hard pressed to be able to repay those loans later on. Additionally, the requirement to continue to pay staff presents a problem as um, with reduced enrollments, we're seeing that some staff are staying at home and not working while others are still working to care for the children that are still going to their center. Um, so finding that balance of still being able to pay for their entire staff has been difficult for them. By providing child care programs with much needed funding through the CARES Act loans and continued child care subsidy payments, Nevada is taking the initial steps needed to ensure that child care providers can sustain their businesses long enough to reopen once the economy reopens. Um, it should be noted that Nevada was able to make the majority of these changes by utilizing over the over 320 or not 320, sorry, um, thir over $32 million of funding that the state received through um, the federally passed CARES Act. I'm looking forward, the Children's Advocacy Alliance is still um, continuing to advocate at the federal levels for continued supports for the child care industry. Um, the recently released HEROES Act includes an additional $7 billion in funding for child care um, across the nation. If this bill was passed, Nevada would receive an estimated $64 million to continue to support um, the child care industry. But even with that, those, the funding that's included in the HEROES Act, that's still well short of the estimated need that we need across the nation to support the, um, the long-term stability of the industry, of the child care industry. Um, right now, the estimates for the overall need is um, over $50 billion going forward. As Nevada slowly reopens as a state, we must work together to ensure our working families have a safe and reliable place to send their children. Looking towards the next legislative session, our child care providers will continue to need, continue to, need um, to receive supports to reopen and once again provide high quality care for our children. Um, one of the ways to do so um, that the state could do with little to, little to no cost is to conduct a legislative study of all the potential barriers to entry for our providers, such as zoning regulations, required trainings, fees assessed, license requirements, um, and other ways that we can streamline paperwork and reporting while still ensuring that quality standards that we have remain in place. The study should also focus on ways that we can maximize federal funding, as Ms. Um, Oria mentioned in her presentation, um, by looking how we can kind of streamline programs and utilize and braid funding, um, such as the child care subsidy funding, Head Start, and our pre-K um, dollars to make sure that we're providing um, care for all of our children going forward. Um, the Children's Advocacy Alliance also re recommends that the state um, look to pass up to a year of paid parental leave so parents can stay home with their children. Um, this would help reduce the overall need for child care in our state. Um, we should also continue to expand, um, private, uh, expand on our private public partnerships to leverage funding um, to leverage a federally available funding, not only in pre-K, but also looking at ways that we can support the school districts. If we, um, if in the next school year, we start to implement a shift model as Governor Sisolak mentioned this morning, as we anticipate that many of our younger children, if we, that typically would be in the K through 12 system and go into school full time, if we 
shift to a model where a child may only go for three days or so, we really need to ensure that that child um, who previously would be in school is still in a safe location um, so their parents can, re while their parents are working. Um, we should continue to use um, all the federal funding available through the Child Care Development Block Grant to support our early learning providers and help ensure that our children can um, continue to receive high quality care. And then lastly, looking to um, a better align systems at the um, early learning level, but also align systems um, for all of the programs and supports that, um, that really work to support our families and our children and families across the state. So looking to um, create a cabinet position or some position at the, um, at the state level to really ensure that all of the funding that we're receiving as a state, that we're using that effectively across all of the systems. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to recognize all of the amazing work that our early learning providers are currently doing. It's very difficult to ensure that our children are safe and well and they're practicing um, social distancing while also um, providing a high level quality of care um, for our children during this time. And our early learning providers have really stepped up. So I think um, just anything we can do to try to recognize all of the work that that they're doing. Um, so with that, um, we are open to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you for that. And you, and you are correct. The amazing work that, um, that our child care providers and teachers and pre-K and, and everyone is doing um, to help keep our children safe. At this point, do we have any questions from, um, I see we have a question from Assemblywoman Tolls. So um, please proceed, Assemblywoman. Thank you so much. So first, I appreciate the recommendation for a legislative study on barriers to entry. That's something that we've worked on a lot in regards to the occupational licensing side of things. And so I'd be very interested in pursuing that. So thanks for that recommendation. And just a quick question um, for Dr. or Director Oya. And you mentioned um, Head Start programs and the importance of pre-K, particularly for ELL. And um, I, I've come across a program called Upstart. I'm just wondering if you're looking at that. It's got some, some um, grant funding money for a program specifically online for um, students uh, who are ELL and then um, non-ELL students. Just wondering if that's shown up on your radar. It has, and I do have a meeting with them on Monday, June 8th. Um, and so just know some preliminary information about them. So I don't want to go into far detail. Our biggest concern around um, any program that's online is that screen time recommendation. It, it's really not a replacement. And they, they say that it's not a replacement for full-time pre-K, but it, it really isn't the ideal way to um, to provide those services. And so, you know, 15 minutes a day on the computer, it, it really doesn't, you know, replace the interactions that children need with other children and with their teacher and with the materials and things like that. So I, I don't want to speak too much more about it since I haven't met with them yet, but we are meeting. Good, thanks. I, especially as we are still looking at online options, just interested to see how that discussion goes forward. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblywoman. Do we have questions from any other committee members? Okay, seeing no further questions, then we can close this agenda item. Thank you again for um, the presentation on agenda item seven. At this point, we are on agenda item eight, which is public comment. And again, I would like to invite anyone wishing to make public comment at this time to please call in. Again, there are several ways you can participate as detailed in the agenda online. You can call us for, um, you can call us at the number 1-669-900-6833, then enter meeting ID, for, enter meeting ID 941 8182 and then press pound. As a reminder, public comment will be limited to two minutes. Uh, 
we will also if there were any public comments that were early that were submitted earlier today to LCB they can read those um, on the record for you as well so again we're going to limit to two minutes to give any callers a chance to call I'm sorry we're going to limit limit public comment to two minutes but we're also going to wait a few minutes to give any um, one who wants to call in right now for public comment to give them a chance to call in and get into the queue. In our broadcast and production services if we have anyone on the line that would like to make public comment please um, add our first caller caller with the last three of eight three zero please state and spell your name for the record you may begin autumn tampa a-u-t-u-m-n T-A-M-P-A. I want to say thank you to all the previous presenters and public commentators for excellent information. Please let me say that when I go to CCSD school board meetings that I am treated with both courtesy and respect. It is about the many school and department administrators that I and my colleagues have worked with in the past 22 years that I am speaking of. I would like to... Um, Sorry, but your uh, meeting was, <laughs> the minutes were mixed up with the, the uh, thing. I'd like to um, say that it's CCSD administrators include, in the, I would like to see CCSD administrators include, encourage, and allow education support professionals to give more input into the reopening of CCSD schools and also with day-to-day -day school operations. SOT teams are not enough to allow this to happen. Most education support professionals have daily contact and involvement in the education of our students, especially our most vulnerable and high-risk, high-need students. ESPs have valuable insight and understanding that can offer much-needed ideas and support to our students and our schools. Another concern I have is for COVID-19 high-risk employees not having adequate opportunity for the new ADA accommodations category. An unpaid leave of absence is not an acceptable option. Being easily able to transfer into less high-risk positions or allowing volunteers to transfer into more high-risk positions would help address this concern. The other area of concern that I have is about 9, 10, 11 month support staff employees and unemployment. We do not qualify for unemployment. Generally, we do not have enough resources and rely on a second job, credit cards, and welfare to make it through the summer. Now, during the global pandemic, there is no help for us during this summer break. I am asking the Nevada legislature to fix this by amending, waiving, or eliminating the NRS during this crisis. Thank you, Autumn Tampa. Thank you so much for that. If we could have the next caller, please. Caller with the last three, two, two, two. Please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Adler, S-A-R-A-H-A-D-L-E-R. Uh, chairwoman and members of the committee, I appreciate this opportunity. There has been a lot of important information shared today. Uh, representing the Nevada Coalition to End Domestic and Sexual Violence, I simply want to underscore and appreciate Chief Renwick and his positive and proactive approach to 
addressing crimes of violence against students, uh, his pursuit of the VAWA grants and creating the Campus Community Coordinated Response Team. I just want to add for all your information, this is particularly important as U.S. Secretary of Education Betsy DeVos just issued new Title IX regulations that are, we believe, going to make it more challenging for students to utilize Title IX to achieve response and protections when a student is subject to sexual assault and harassment. So we appreciate uh, Chief Renwick's uh, positive work in this area. Thank you. Thank you. Our next caller, please. Next caller with the last three of 577. Seven. Please state and spell your name for the record. You may begin. Caller with the last three of 577. Seven. You are now live. I'm good, thank you. Thank you, sir. Madam Chair, that is all the participants in the public comment lobby at this time. Okay, thank you. At this time, uh, Ms. Sturm will read two public comments that had been submitted online to her today. Ms. Sturm? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So we did receive um, a handful of comments to our generic email um, uh, the education committee email. Um, so we'll get those, we'll get all the, the public comments online, but we did receive a few um, once the committee started and I'll read to you those that um, didn't already speak. Uh, good morning, members of the committee. Andrea Connolly, principal of Nevada Learning Academy. This comment is in response to the question about the availability of online schools in Nevada. In addition to those mentioned, Nevada Learning Academy at CCSD is an online 6 through 12 school that is available to all Nevada students. Uh, NVLA is a public school that is part of CCSD and is not a charter school program. NVLA serves approximately 4,000 students during the school year and 7,000 students during the summer term. Thank you. Signed, Andrea Connolly. The next person we have was from Leanne Shelton. Uh, during this crisis, many children in one of the most fragile groups, early childhood special education, have not been receiving hands-on services. Many children with needs in this age range can often not be assisted virtually um, and skills are regressing. Would you be willing to allow clinicians and special educators to begin a home visiting program? Respectfully, Leanne Shelton. And let's see, we did actually just receive one more comment uh, in the last minute or so. Uh, greetings from Kathy Yoder Base. Thank you for taking the time to listen to agenda item seven. I understand our agenda item was late in the afternoon and everyone is tired. Please take time to thoroughly review the items provided by Ms. Oya, Mrs. Elquist, and the Children's Advocacy Alliance. As a private child care facility owner and principal, we work hard to provide high quality early education. We are really struggling. Out of our 122 currently enrolled students, we only have three families that still need childcare. We have had to temporarily close our doors after seven years of business as a four-star QRIS rated facility. We need help. We all need to take a hard look at differentiating daycares and quality ECE facilities, preschools like ours. We have low teacher and family turnover. We have spent the last seven weeks working virtually with our students as we made our pivot to distance ed. We had to not only facilitate curriculum, but we had to make sure our families are supported since they are predominantly low income families. Dropping off diapers, wipes, food, etc., to families uh, to make sure they are still being cared for at a safe distance providing food distribution, site information, and resources for utilities. We really need support from our Nevada legislature. Thank you and be well. Signed, Kathy Yoder-Base. 
And then we did receive yet another comment in the last minute or so from Cindy Gonzalez. Um, our early childhood educators are the foundation of the state's ability to open or reopen. Uh, therefore, as a state, we must take care of them now and always please continue to support Nevada Pre-K and other high quality child care centers and homes. And that concludes the public comment received after <laughs> the meeting started. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Stern. With that, are there any uh, additional comments from any members on the committee before we adjourn? Okay, with that, um, we are finished with our agenda for today. The fifth meeting is currently scheduled for Tuesday, June 16th, 2020. It will also be virtual. Please continue to check the committee's websites for updates. And with that, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you so much for staying engaged and everyone staying um, with us through this meeting. I know virtual is not our preferred way. Okay, we can stop and just know that there are real requirements, they're not meeting them. And how do we change that? Why? participating in and in sharing information and that's what i'm going to do i'm going to upload this video and i hope other people watch it and learn what's happening right now in nevada in regards to education in the meeting call. subscribe to my youtube channel and follow me on facebook Darlene Anderson. Darlene Billings Anderson.